All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerful at work, them all, that they were no needy person among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from sales and put it at the apostles' feet and was distributed to anyone who, ha who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and bought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge to keep back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest of and but bought the rest and put at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you, you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to, to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias, Ananias heard this, he fell, fell down and died. A great fear seized all who heard what happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out to, and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what happened. Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, How could you conspire the test of the Spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at, are at the door, and they will carry you out, you out also. At that moment, she fell down at, at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized, to, seized the whole church and all who here heard about this event. Thanks very much for reading, Ruth. And yeah, let me add my welcome to, to Joel's and to Mark's. As Joel said, I'm Andy and I'm the children and youth worker here. Um, let me pray for us um, as we start. Heavenly Father, we need your help by your Spirit, uh, not just to understand uh, what you're saying to us by your word, uh, but to hear it and accept it and live in the light of it. Please be with uh, me now as I speak and us all as we hear what you have to say, that we might love you more and live more uh, as you would have us live. Amen. Um, so, uh, I don't know what you made of those two passages that, that Ruth read for us. Um, and they're both pretty dark, really, aren't they? And in some sense, it seems to escalate quite quickly. I remember the first time, I, I will, we'll be focusing on that, that second passage in Acts, and the first time I read that passage, I almost found it bizarre. Because, it, you know, everything looks like it's going really well, all the believers living together. And then, kind of, if only a few verses later, you've got two dead bodies having been carried out. And it just seems kind of over the top almost, or, or harsh. And maybe you're here today for the first time in a while or for the first time in, in church ever, and, and you're thinking, well, that, I don't get that. Is, is that. is that what God's like? Is God kind of this vindictive, overreactive, harsh God that puts Achan to death and then puts an Ananias and Sapphira to death too? And, and as we start to understand what's going on in, in these stories, and in particular we're going to focus on uh, this account of Ananias and Sapphira, and what that means for us today, I think we have to start by grasping quite how important and precious and valuable the thing that Ananias and Sapphira damage is. Quite how valuable what they damage is. Because we, we all understand, I think, that the more valuable something is 
the more of a crime it is to damage it, right? So if I take this uh, wonderful bulletin and I scribble all over it with my pen, it's not very good scribbling, but if I scribbled it and ruined it and ruined it, does anyone really care? There's like loads out the back. Maybe Pete Sinclair or whoever's kind of put, taking the time to put it together might be a bit sad, but it's not really a big deal. Okay, but imagine instead of taking my pen onto a, a bulletin, I took a paintbrush onto the, the stairwell of my estate. And instead of scribbling there, I scribbled, on the, I scribbled with red paint on the, the stairwell of my estate. Okay, that, that's, people would care, right? People would be like, well, who's done that? They'd want to find out, and if they found out it was me, I'd be in some trouble, I might get fined. But ultimately, I don't think it's going to be that big a deal. It's not going to be that big a deal. Because that's more valuable than a bulletin. But, whereas, imagine instead that somehow... I got my hands on this painting. Let's have, the, let's have the painting. Um, this is Salvador Mundi by Leonardo da Vinci. In 2017, it sold for $450 million. It's the most expensive painting in the world. I don't know whether you like it or not. It's quite dark, isn't it? Um, so imagine that I took my red paint and I did that. <laughs> All over the face of Jesus. Now I'm in trouble, <laughs> okay? £450 million pounds worth of trouble dollars worth of trouble. So we all understand that the more valuable something is, the bigger a crime it is to damage it. And what I want us to see is that Ananias and Sapphira haven't scribbled over the face of a picture of Jesus. They've damaged the very body of Jesus in the church. And that is why God cares. Because that is so much more valuable to him than any painting. So that's where we're going to start, by looking at a beautiful unity, the beauty and importance of what Ananias and Sapphira damage. A beautiful unity damaged by a dangerous lie, and God's response of a fearful judgment. So first, uh, a beautiful unity. So by this stage of the book of Acts, Luke's account of the life of the early church, there are a good number of believers. According to Acts 4 verse 4, we've got at least 5,000 believers together in Jerusalem. And in the last few verses of chapter 4 that we had read to us from 32 to 37, Luke is describing for us what the community of, that, of those believers was like, what it looked like for them to live together. And it's stunning. It's absolutely beautiful. Look down with me at verse 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. I struggle to imagine that even. I don't know about you, all the believers were one in heart and mind. They loved one another so much and, and Jesus so much that they were united fully, that someone could come and look at them and say, those guys are one, they're united in heart and mind. It might feel unattainable to us. It might feel totally impossible. But the good news is that I don't think it is. I think it is possible because Luke shows how they can be united like that. How such a beautiful unity is possible. Verse 33, with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Why is Luke telling us that? Well, because he's trying to show us that the unity here isn't because they got on well naturally. It's not because they're all super similar and like each other. No, it's because they were united in their faith in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. The apostles are testifying to Jesus, just like we saw Peter do back in Acts 2. Speaking of his life, that kingdom embodying a joyful, healing, restoration life that he brought into the world. His death, that God would send his son to die that we might be forgiven and have life. His resurrection, that he might conquer death and enjoy an eternal life that we can share. And they're preaching those words, they're testifying to the risen, ascended Jesus. And God is powerfully at work. God's grace, verse 33, is powerfully at work in them all. And so God is working through the preaching of the apostles and through his Holy Spirit to form from himself a people united in the risen Jesus. United as they're filled with the Holy Spirit, as they become the body of Christ across all kinds of divisions. And what does that unity look like? This is where our minds just should be absolutely blown. Okay, verse 32. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, 
but they shared everything they had. Verse 34, halfway through, from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet so that it could be distributed to anyone who had need. That's amazing. That's what unity looks like. That's what it really looks like. It looks like people saying, stop crying mine. We all cry mine or everything. And they said, look look at verse 32, no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. They stopped crying mine and started saying, yeah, yours. We think we're great, don't we, when we give out our income. They're doing more than giving out their income. They're looking at what they have. They're selling it and they're giving it to the church. It's astonishing. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's what unity really looks like. And what was the result? Look down with me at the start of verse 34, because this is, this is right at the heart of Luke, what, what Luke wants us to see here. There was no needy person among them. Imagine that. A community where no one goes hungry. No one is alone. No one is left in need. That's what's so valuable in God's eyes. That's what's so beautiful. That's what's so important. His precious church. A community united in Jesus, sharing and giving all that they have so that there will be no one in need. Do we see church like that? Like God sees it? Do we want it? Because I think if we step back, we long for community like that, don't we? We absolutely long for it. Do you not long to be part of a community that puts its money where its mouth is on unity, that doesn't just say we're united, but lives as a body of people supporting and caring for each other? Do you not long for the security of knowing that if you lost your job and fell on hard times, there would be somebody there for you? Your brothers and sisters in the church, your church family would be there for you. And somewhere inside us, do you not long to really know what Jesus means when he says it's more blessed to give than to receive? Do you not long to be free from the way that money enslaves our hearts and instead to give it generously and see the good that it can do as we recognise what Jesus has already done for us? What a church that would be. What a community that would be and what a witness that would be to the world around us. To this community, to this city. They're so divided. John Calvin, the great uh, reformer and theologian, drew out the contrast like this between uh, this community and the world. He said, at that time, in the early church, love made each person's own possessions common property for those in need. I'll say that again. Love made each person's own possessions common property for those in need. In our day, such is the inhumanity of many that they begrudge the poor a common dwelling upon the earth, the common use of water, air and sky. And you might be thinking, come on, come off it, John, that's an exaggeration. That they, they begrudge the, the poor a common use of the earth, common dwelling on the earth. I tell you, in 2018 in London, that is no exaggeration. <laughs> I was talking uh, to Pete, uh, one of the, the pastors here, and he was saying that they're building a new block on uh, his estate, and like most of the new blocks, there's going to be um, some council housing, some social housing, and some new private housing. Two doors, right? This is for millions of people. Two doors, two new doors, one for the social tenants, one for the private tenants. People don't want to share doors with the poor, let alone their possessions. That's the city we live in. So what a bright, that's dark, right? So what a bright light a community where no one was in need would be. A community united around Jesus, sharing and giving all they have. And so we should be passionately committed to building and protecting the unity of the church for the sake of our brothers and sisters, yes, but also for the sake of the city around us. And it's in that context that we have to hear the warning of what Ananias and Sapphira do. They're showing us what not to do how to damage this beautiful, precious, God-glorifying, world-wandering unity 
So a beautiful unity is threatened by a dangerous lie. A dangerous lie. Look down with me at the start of chapter 5. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but bought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. So it becomes clear through the rest of the passage that what Ananias and Sapphira are doing here is trying to trick and deceive the apostles and the church. They've they've sold this piece of property and what they want to do is to give the impression to everybody else that they've taken the whole proceeds and given everything to the church, just like Barnabas did in verse 36 and 37. What they've actually done is sold the property, given some to the church and kept some for themselves. And that's, really, that's most obvious that they want to do this deception in verse 8. So this is Peter talking to Sapphira. Peter asks her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Right, so that's, is this the full value of what you sold that land for? Yes, Sapphira said, that is the price. Peter asked her, is this the full value? She knew it wasn't the full value, but she lied She tried to deceive the church. And that, that lie, is what Peter condemns Ananias and Sapphira for. So look look down with verse 3. How is it, Peter says, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? Verse 4, at the end, you have not lied just to human beings, but to God. Verse 9, Peter says to Sapphira, how could you conspire to test the Spirit of the Lord by lying to the Spirit? So I want to be clear exactly what Ananias and Sapphira get wrong here. They were not under an obligation to sell the property. They didn't have to sell it. It was voluntary generosity. We see that really clearly in verse 4. Listen to what Peter says. Didn't it, the property, belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? It was yours. You were under no obligation but they decided to try to deceive the apostles, to deceive the church. And it's that lie about their generosity that threatens the unity of the church. And hopefully we're starting to see that this is not a a kind of garden variety lie. It's not taking a cookie from the jar and not telling your mum, simple as that is. This is lying to the church, and because it's lying to the church, it's lying to God. So look look at what Peter says He says in verse 3 that you've lied to the Holy Spirit, and then in verse 4, you've lied not just to human beings, but to God. Peter understands that God in his great grace and kindness has has decided to dwell in his church by the Spirit. This is the new temple. This is where God is. And that's true of this church here, just as it was true of the church in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. This is where God dwells. And so when you lie to the church... You lie to God, the father of truth, the one who knows all of our secrets and our our hearts. Ananas and Sapphira are trying to deceive the one who knows all things. They're They're mocking the king of the universe and they're marring the face of Jesus in the church. And so you might be, if you're anything like me, starting to think, okay, I see, I see it's a big deal. I see that what they did was, was really very wrong and it, it had the potential to help to really damage something very valuable. But what's it got to do with me? I, I suspect that, that maybe very, very few of us will be sitting here thinking, yes, I have done that. I have lied about my generosity to the church. Very few of us will be thinking that. And so the challenge, but the challenge I want to lay down is why? Why have we not lied about the generosity of the church, if we're honest. Is it because in our heart of hearts we are more honest and more generous than Ananias and Sapphira? Or is it, if we're honest, that we're more British? Is the reason you've never lied about your giving or your generosity to church simply that you've never had a chance to lie because you've never talked about it with anybody? if we started to talk to each other about what we did with our money, 
Do you think in your heart of hearts that quite quickly you'd find yourself covering up? Maybe a few white lies, just a bit of gloss. <laughs> just to make ourselves look a bit better. And by the way, we should talk to each other about money, right? We're, there's no reason to be any less accountable on that than any other area of our lives. <sighs> but as we do that, and we're honest with ourselves, I think we'll see that we're not to- while we're not told what Ananias and Sapphira's motivation is, we're not told really why they do what they do, We don't find it that hard to imagine why they did what they did. And we don't find it that hard to see those same sinful motivations in our own heart. So perhaps they just wanted to look better than they really were. They wanted to be counted with guys like Barnabas who really had sold everything and given everything. And if I look inside myself, I know that sin. I know that desire to look better than I am just to gloss things over, push up some numbers a bit, just, just to make things look slightly better so that I get to feel like I'm, I'm looking good. Do you know that in your own heart? Or perhaps it was just this sense that they'd done enough by giving part of the money. Look, we've sold this. We've given loads of it to church. Why is it anyone's business what we do with the rest? I've done enough. That's what my heart says every time I hear somebody say, have you considered your giving to church? Have you reviewed your giving to church? My heart screams at me, I'm doing enough, I'm doing enough, I'm doing enough. Does yours? Or perhaps simply they were looking for that illusory security outside of God. They wanted to give as much as they could until it would actually mean that they were depending on other people and on God to provide for them. They were really, really willing to be generous until it was going to threaten their kind of financial security on their own two feet. That's what I'm like. Very happy to give until it means that like, actually you'd have to sacrifice something or actually things wouldn't feel quite as, as comfortable or secure. Is that what you're like? Because as we maybe see those simple motivations in our hearts and recognise them in ourselves it's crucial that we hear what God does next, how he responds. So a beautiful unity, a dangerous lie, and now a fearful judgment. Let me read again um, from verse 3, a fearful judgment. Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. Ananias hears Peter's words of judgment, and he dies. Same with Sapphira, verse 9. Peter said to Sapphira, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. She hears Peter's word of judgment. She dies. And we're left, there's no wriggle room, we're left with no doubt that God has judged their sin and has put them to death. God gives us every breath we take. The next breath you take is a gift from God, and he chooses to give no more breaths to Ananias and Sapphira. And this is not, please hear me on this, this is not God lashing out. This is not an an angry, reckless God lashing out. No, it is it is a surgeon, a top draw, top class surgeon, performing a crucial operation. Cutting out the bad to save the body. In the words of the church father, John Chrysostom, the matter, this matter, was not simply one to be passed over, like a gangrene, like an infection. It must be cut out that it might not infect the rest of the body. God is an expert surgeon preserving the health of his church by cutting out the infection. And he does it because he loves people. 
He does it because he loves humanity and wants everybody to come to know him. And he's given this mission, this mission of carrying the good news of Jesus to his church. And so when sin threatens the health of his church and the effectiveness of its mission, he will not tolerate it. He will not tolerate it. So how did the people who saw this respond or heard about it? How did these initial witnesses respond to this necessary judgment, this crucial operation? With a godly fear. Verse 5. Great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Verse 11. After the death of Sapphira, great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. They are fearful not because suddenly they don't know what God is like, they don't know what he's going to do next, but precisely because they do know what God is like. They're fearful precisely because they do know what God is like. He is a holy God. He is pure. He is mighty. He is radiant in glory. And he cannot tolerate sin. He cannot because of his goodness. And he has acted to judge sin in his church. And they look at themselves in front of a holy God and they recognise that they are sinful people facing the judgment of this God. And so they're seized by a great fear. A reverent and appropriate great fear. Now, I know that as I say that, the idea of fearing God is a tricky and unpopular and difficult one uh, to our ears. It's, uh, I, I don't naturally find it easy to, to think through. Sometimes it's almost like fearing God is, is we only fear God if we haven't really grasped his love, his goodness, his kindness. We wouldn't fear God if we'd understood those things. It's a, it's a kind of hangover from a pagan, scary view of God, not, not, the, not the friendly God of the Bible. Well, can I gently suggest that that has absolutely nothing to do with the Bible and everything to do with our culture? That, that fearing, the idea of fearing God is a bad thing has nothing to do with the Bible and everything to do with our culture. A culture which has no place anymore for authority that needs to be revered or respected or feared. A culture where we have enthroned ourselves as master of the house and so the lion of scripture can no longer run wild but must be a domestic pet that makes us feel better. Because if you look at this passage, fear is healthy and fear is necessary. So look at Sapphira, okay? So, so in verse 5, Ananias dies. Great fear seizes all who heard what's happened. What's the first thing we are told about Sapphira when she comes in in verse 7? Not knowing what had happened. She doesn't know. And so she hasn't been seized by this great fear. And so when Peter says, tell the truth effectively, she lies. I think it's totally reasonable. It seems totally reasonable to me to think that if she had heard and responded with a godly fear, she would have told the truth, repented, confessed and lived. Fear is vital here in this story. Fear, fear would have kept her alive. A right fear of God would have kept Sapphira alive. So why is fear in God healthy and necessary? Not, please hear me on this, not because... We need to know that there's a rod at our backs. Not because we need to be driven on to try and be better people in our own strength, but because as we see a holy God in all of his glory and majesty, as we see our sin and as we fear him rightly, it drives us to our knees. We need to say with Isaiah, as he saw the glory of the Lord in Isaiah 6, woe to me, I am ruined. For I am a person of unclean lips. This is where we have to start. This is where we have to start as we build the church, as we seek to take the good news of Jesus to the world. We have to start on our knees. We have to start with the recognition that we need forgiveness from a holy God who has no reason to grant it to us other than his mercy and love and grace towards us. Because then we see the glory of the gospel then we see the light of the gospel that Jesus has made this forgiveness possible. That God sent his son to die for us that as we confess our sin, God will forgive us and restore us. 
God will forgive our sins if we confess them. Praise the Lord. God will forgive our sins if we confess them. But he will not ignore our sins if we ignore them. Let me say that again. God will forgive our sins if we confess them, but he will not ignore our sins if we ignore them. He's much too good for that. He's much too concerned about the health of his church, his people. He's much too concerned about the fate of the lost, who he's sending the church to a mission to not to ignore our sin. He cannot do it. God will forgive our sins if we confess them, but he will not ignore our sins if we ignore them. And so as uh, we close, I want to, to leave us with a challenge. I want to challenge us on the back of the fact that God will not ignore sin in our lives and in the church, even if we do. He has handed out a fearful judgment to his church in the past and there is no reason to think he wouldn't do it again. And so I want to plead with you, plead with you to fear the Lord and repent of your sin. Will we? Will we confess the ways and the times that we've stored up resentment at how things are changing at church rather than bringing it out so that it can be resolved and we can move forward in unity as one body? Will we confess to God and one another the times that we cover up to try and look better rather than being open and vulnerable and honest so we can build the kind of community the world longs for? Will we confess to God and one another how we have failed to respond generously to the generosity, the overwhelming generosity we've received through the Lord Jesus? How we've kept things to ourselves? Have we cultivated selfish hearts rather than a tangible, beautiful unity of giving and sharing? And as we build that unity together, as we build the church together, will we tackle the sin in our lives together? We recognise that the church discipline, the church discipline we have at Inspire St. James is not an infringement of our rights, but a crucial and vital component of what it looks like to build God's church, to protect the unity and the mission of his people. Will we be honest and brave enough to point out the sin in each other's lives? Choosing the good of another over our own comfort. And will we be humble enough to listen when people come to us and say, hey, that was wrong. Will we be humble enough to listen and repent rather than responding in defensiveness and anger? We have a good, good God. A great and magnificent and mighty and loving and kind and wonderful God who will forgive our sins if we confess them. He longs to do it. He's laid down the life of his son to do it. To make a way that we can be forgiven and made right with him. God will forgive our sins if we confess them. But he will not ignore our sins if we ignore them. Let me pray. Father, we're sorry. We're sorry that we don't see the the beauty and glory and, and mag, uh, magnificence and importance of your church, that we don't have our high eyes set high enough for what you would long for us to be for the sake of each other and for the world. And we're sorry that because we don't see that vision and we don't see you in all of your glory, we do not hate our sin nearly enough. Lord, search our hearts. Open us up. Do the surgery you need to do that we might be made more like Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.